pleases the Lord. Cain was very rough knowing this from the Lord. So the question is why this difference between Cain and Abel being educated from the same house. The same parents. Something along the line has gone wrong somewhere. And one is pleasing the Lord and other is not. And this triggered something in Genesis chapter 4 and the verses 8 to 12. The word says that in the course of time, Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. They talked and along the line, when they were in the field, Cain killed his brother, Abel. So you can see that something, some kind of hatred has been built within Cain. And God warned him. He said, Cain, you're going to have to amend your ways because sin is lying at the door. And his desire is to have you change your heart towards your brother. He will not listen. He will then talk to his brother, got angry, and killed his brother. When he did this, then the Lord came to Cain and asked Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And Cain said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, Cain, what hast thou done? Because the voice of thy brother Abel, the voice of thy brother's blood, cried unto me from the ground. And now, are thou cursed from the earth, which had opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand? Therefore, when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. That is a curse. That is a curse. God curse Cain because of his relationship to his brother Abel. The Lord demanded the life of Abel from Cain. Where is thy brother Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? For you God to ask me such a question. I am asking you such a question because your brother's blood is crying unto me from the ground for vengeance. Therefore, I required of your hand your brother's blood. You are cursed. You are originally gifted to be a tiller of the ground. From now onwards, when you will till the ground, it will not yield forth what it's supposed to. You will sweat. You will work harder. You will be a fugitive, always running and chasing things. Vagabond that you are going to be because there is a cry of the blood over your life for vengeance. You know, so when we stand and we say that, oh, this year, God said he's going to bless us. The blessings of the Lord. They are here and amen. And claiming it. I am overcomer. I am dominion. Please. This is one area that everyone and each one of us have to check. Because the word that came, he said that God blessed Abraham because he knew that Abraham will command his children after him. 
that Abraham would teach his children to know the way of the Lord. Adam and Eve, apparently something has gone wrong in the teachings of how to train these children in the house and one has built hatred against the other, despising God and therefore end up killing his brother. And the Lord is holding him accountable for that. So what we can conclude from this is that life could be difficult as the result of our relationship with our siblings. Life could be difficult as the result of our relationship with our siblings. You have to search within yourself. If there is anything that you have done wrongly against a brother, your relations quickly come before the Lord and ask for forgiveness. If there is any form of hatred built in you because of the training given to you at home, maybe your parents love a brother or a sister more than you. It is interesting how the two, one will come to a point to kill the other. Something definitely happened for God to despise the personality of Cain and have respect for Abel. That is our first example. The second example is going to be seen in the family of Isaac and Rebekah. Their children, they were twins. Esau and Jacob. But the story about this family is that Rebekah had a revelation about the children when they were in the womb. Genesis chapter 25 and the verses 21 to 24. Rebecca was barren and Isaac entreated the Lord for Rebecca because she was barren and the Lord entreated of him and Rebecca his wife conceived and the children struggled together within Rebekah's womb. And Rebekah asked the Lord, If it so be, why am I this? And she went, go before the Lord and inquire this of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in thy womb. Two manner of people shall be separated from their bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. There were twins in her womb. You see, Rebecca did not say anything of this revelation to the husband Isaac. Kept the information for herself. And this is going to trigger something in terms of their relationship towards their children. Towards their children. So, the same way that the children Cain and Abel were born with their gifts. One, the keeper of the sheep. The other, the tiller of the ground. We have, in this case, twins. God had already revealed to Rebecca as a result of her request. Because the children were already fighting in the womb. 
And God said, two nations are in your womb. The elder is stronger than the younger one. But he is going to serve the younger one. The elder will serve the younger one. And she, she took notice of that. And these children were born. One Esau love hunting. The other Jacob love dwelling in the tent fellowshipping with his God. And this will bring as a result that the parents will bestow their loves according to the gifts of these children. Mm. So as they were growing, as they grew, in Genesis 25, the verses 31 to 34, we are learning that Jacob said to his brother Esau, sell me this day thy birthright. Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die because I am hungry. And what profit shall it this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Though Jacob despised his birthright. He despised his birthright. Now you can see. God had made a pronouncement concerning these children, two children's life. The older is going to serve the younger. How this, thinks, this is going to be, no one has any idea. But the Lord said that there are two nations in the womb. One despise what is of God. He said, what is birthright to me? But one has understanding of what the birthright is all about. There is something that came out of the education of these children in that house. One have that fellowship with God. Another despise the fellowship with Almighty God. Therefore, their understanding were different. What is birthright to me? You will not understand birthright because you have never had any fellowship with God to receive the divine revelation that is related to the birthright. I am hungry. What is birthright to me? People have sold their destinies simply because they do not have understanding. Many, many souls have sold their destinies because they do not have understanding. He said, I am young. This is my time. This is not your time. Your time is the, the one that the Lord has is written in the book of life for every moment what you are supposed to do. So the moment that you come to be conscious about what life is all about, you cannot afford to despise life. To say that you are young and this is your time. You have to search to know your God. Because there is a time for everything. By the time that you're supposed to learn about your birthright, you are in the woods over there hunting for meat. All he can think of is his stomach. Therefore, he lost something that is essential for life. And we know many, many people of God have come to the same point. And they are reaping bitterly so the most interesting part of it is that Isaac the father came to a point to see himself as someone who is old and closely getting to his grave so he decided to bless his children but according to the tradition birthright 
birthright blessings are important. So the firstborn is supposed to receive a special blessings. Genesis chapter 27 and the verse is 6 to 10. When Isaac spoke such a thing to his son Esau, Rebekah heard and Rebekah came to Jacob, her son, and told Jacob, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto thy brother Esau, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord, before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good cates of the goats. And I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat and that he may bless thee before his death. The Lord told Rebekah, two nations are in your womb. One is going to serve the other. The older, the elder will serve the younger. She heard that the blessings were going to Esau, who is supposed to serve Jacob, the junior one. And she quickly Call Jacob. Jacob, quickly, go get me two goats. Tender ones. Let me cook as your father loves. You will take it to him because he had already commanded your brother Esau to go and hunt and bring him meat that he may eat and bless him in his pleasure. Listen to me, my son. Go ahead and do that. So, Rebecca sided with Jacob and deceived the husband, Isaac, and the son, Esau. And Isaac blessed Jacob. The blessings that were supposed to go to Esau, definitely came upon Jacob. So now in Genesis 27, the verses 38 to 40, after that Esau had found out that his blessings had gone to his brother Jacob, Esau came to his father. He said, Father, hast thou but one blessing, my father? Do you have only one blessing? Bless me, bless me too. Oh, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword, by thy sword shall thy live and shall serve thy brother and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Hallelujah. Hey, it is amazing. Esau came, discovered that his blessings has been released to Jacob to whom he already sold his birthright. Therefore, the birthright blessings automatically came upon Jacob. Now that he is realizing what the birthright is all about, run quickly to the father. Father, please bless me too. He said, it is over. Do you have only one blessing? I'm sorry, my son, it is over. Father, bless me too. Okay. Well, the fatness of the earth shall be your portion. But 
You will live by the sword. You will save your younger brother. Isn't that amazing? This is exactly the revelation that Rebecca received when the children were already in the womb. And it came out of Isaac's mouth to Esau as one of his blessings. You will be a slave to your brother. And it came as a blessing. <laughs> this could not possibly be a blessing. He will have dominion over you until you work hard to overcome his yoke over your life. Then at that moment, you will be free. So, when these things had happened, in Genesis 27, verse 41 to 44, we read, because of what happened, Esau hated Jacob, his brother, because of the blessing. Well, wait, his father blessed him. He hated his brother. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. <laughs> he said, you know what? <laughs> I am waiting for my father to die. And as soon as my father dies, then I will kill my brother Jacob because he had stolen my blessings. But he had already forgotten that he sold his birthright to him for food. For food. For food. You know, we have to remember these children, they were already divided because one, Isaac, the father, loved Esau and he loved eating the hunting meat from Esau. But Rebecca loved Jacob because Rebecca had a divine revelation from the Lord. She knew the outcome of these children, the future of these children. What the Lord have said, it, it was already ringing within her. I have to train these children in such a way that the, 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 the older one will, will, will serve the younger. God made it possible for her to hear what the father said. Esau, go get me good meat. Cook, let me eat and bless you. The parents did not even know. That the things has already turned around because Jacob is now having the birthright of Esau. The dominion was already established. And the blessings followed and Esau wept and had now harboring within his heart hatred against his brother Jacob. And said, as soon as my daddy, my father, father dies, I would definitely kill you. So, these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And Rebekah sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, do comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran, and tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away. In other words, move away from here because your brother has intention to kill you as a result of the blessings that has come upon you. You can see how Brothers and sisters can build hatred. Within the same, one is careful about life, another one is not. When one is studying, another one is playing. The parents are telling you that come and sit down and study. But you love going to play football. And your younger brother is sitting down there and studying and studying and studying. 
The outcome is that you do not come out with anything as far as your life is concerned because you despise every single teachings of your parents. And the time comes that the demarcation is clear. And now you develop hatred against your brother, against your sister. Simply because of what the Lord has done in the person's life. Well, this is one more example. We are going to listen to another one. This same Jacob grew up and became a father and also had sons. Have to look at, you know, how the academic nature is being repeated to, <laughs> you know, in, 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 in his people's life, Jacob grew and have 12 sons. This man Jacob, that God has changed his name from Jacob to Israel. But Jacob in Genesis 37 verse 3 to 5. Jacob that is called Israel. He loved his son Joseph more than all his children. Because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph had a dream. And he told his dream to his brothers. And they even hated him more. You see where the hatred came from? The hatred came from the fact that the father loved Joseph more than all the brothers. Simply because he said, this is my little one. I had Joseph in my old age. Something that seems so small. And you'll be thinking that the brothers, you know, the siblings will be happy because this is our little brother. Oh no, oh no, no, because father went to the extent of making him a special coat coat of many colors and we did not receive anything so as a result of that it built hatred within themselves and this is something that you know children they are so sensitive how brothers and sisters come to develop hatred against each other. Small things like this. Small things like that. You saw your mother giving a bigger meat to your brother. You saw your father calling your sister to come and take the rest of the food. And she ate alone. And it has been going on and on and on and on. And as a result of that, he said that father do not love me. Father loved my sister so much. And mother is also ranging on the side of the other children. And I am despised. So it has built hatred within you. Or they hated you because you are loved by your parents. We are not talking about the circle, you know, outside the circle of immediate parents. Blood, brothers, and blood sisters. So, in Genesis 37, verse 11, he said that because of Jacob's love to his son Joseph, his brethren, they envied him. They envied him. They envied him. And verse 17 to 20 of Genesis 37, he said, As Jacob 
sending his son Joseph with his brothers to watch over the flock. They started building that hatred saying that we have to find a way to also kill our brother Joseph. So they went to a place, a dotan, and they did not want to, to have Joseph know where they have, they have been so that Joseph would just get lost in the field. But the grace of God was just right there and allowed a man to come and show Joseph the way of his brethren, saying that they have gone to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and find them, he found them in Dothan. And when they saw Joseph afar off, even before he came near unto his brothers, they conspired against him to slay him. They conspired against him to kill him. And they said one to another, Behold, the dreamer is coming. The one that dreamed, it is what he dreamt and he told them and they even hated him more. Behold, the dreamer is coming. Come now thence, verse 20. Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into the pit. And we will say, some evil beast had devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Let's kill him and let's see what will become of his dreams. Hallelujah. And these are brothers. Brothers acting against their own brother and it's so hatred was built in such a way that in genesis 23 uh, genesis 37 verse 23 to 24 he said it came to pass when joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped joseph out of his coat the coat of many colors that the father gave and they took him and cast him into a pit and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. So he didn't die right away. But in Genesis 37 verse 26 to 28. Judah said unto his brethren. What profit is it for we? He said what profit is it? If we slay our brother. And conceal his blood. Because the Lord will require his blood of us. As he did in the case of Cain killing his brother Abel. Where is thy brother? His blood is crying unto me from the ground. So then Judah purpose saying, Please brethren, come. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren, they were content. Then there came to pass by the Midianite. These were the merchant men. And they drew and lifted Joseph from the pit. And sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. For 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph to Egypt. Hallelujah. They sold their brother for 20 pieces. Of silver and Joseph went into slavery. So, to justify themselves before the father in Genesis 37, verse 31 to 33, they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid, a kid of goat and dipped the goat, the coat in the blood. They dipped the coat in the blood and they sent the coat of many colors. And they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast had devoured him. Joseph is without doubt. 
and rent in pieces. Joseph is without that. Without doubt, rent in pieces. He has been killed by an animal. You see, these are three different examples. We said we're going to go through a few scriptures to see what relationship brothers and sisters can actually be. How we come to build hatred as a result of many things that could happen at the home. But what we have to take out of this, you know, scriptures as a counsel of the Lord is that let your heart be set after God. Let your heart be set after God. May you fear almighty God. Whatever that had happened when you were being brought up, you have to change the heart and see God as the ultimate. You who were despised, God is still in control. You who has been set to be nobody, the Lord is still in control. Every form of hatred against you, it will not work because God knows you and everything that the Lord has said that he's going to do, he is going to do them. No matter what they have planned against you, whatever that they have done, it is all coming to naught because your God is God. To him alone be the glory. In Jesus name. Amen. I have always been saying, I said, since you make time to come to church, come for prayers and all that, you have chosen to follow God. So, you have to make sure that every single thing that you are doing day by day, it's in line with what the Lord required of you. You have to make sure that everything that you are doing is in line with what God required of you. As stewards of the living God, we understand that stewardship is not anything else, but it deals only with every single thing that God has given us. Stewardship deals only with every single thing that God has given to the believers, including material things, spiritual things, such as, you know, the gift that we receive from the Lord, spiritual gifts that we get from the Lord, or knowledge and abilities. It is all part of the things that we have received as stewards of the Lord. So stewardship is concerned with how one uses these things that God has given him. Stewardship concerns how one is using these gifts, this knowledge, and these abilities that God has given him on behalf of the Lord and also for the Lord's work. It's very important. So everything that we receive from God, it is meant to give back to God or give back for the Lord's work. Very, very important. And today we are going to talk about givings. And giving is one of the facets of stewardship. Giving is one of the facets of stewardship. And it deals specifically with the aspect of money. Giving is one of the facets of stewardship. And it deals with monetary or finances. And this has been the problem to many because they are not always understanding the purpose of giving. And more I look into things, into scriptures, I come to realize that this facet of our stewardship, the enemy has targeted and using it 
as a great tool against the children of God. When the Lord commands us to give and it becomes a blockage in a believer's mind and heart, so we are blocked and are not willing to release what God gives us. It is a satanic weapon against your blessings. And you, we will be talking more and more and more and more about it because one thing that is sure is that nobody receives anything except the Lord gives as a saint of the living God. If you are expecting from Satan, you are not God's steward. So what we receive from the Lord it is meant to take care of us and to take care of the church for the work of the Lord. So he's, he's the one that gives seed to the sower and he gives bread to the eater. You have to be moved from the position of eating to be a sower. So when you have received your seed, you will not eat your seed. If you eat your seed, that's it. You have nothing to sow. Because you have eaten your seed. The seed, it is meant to sow. And the bread is meant to be eaten. But we have people that are eating their bread and coming and praying and praying and praying, even when the Lord still sow the seed in their lives, they turn their seeds to be bread. And they eat it. There is no amount of prayer. There is no amount of prayer that will move the believer to a higher level of finances. Because it is subject to kingdom principle. It is subject to kingdom principle. And that principle, we will be talking more and more and more and more about it and giving more and more explanation because we don't want to serve this God in our rikiki ways. In other words, serving God in poverty. Jesus Christ was rich. He was made poor so that you and I will walk in dominion. In financial dominion. And this is not a joke. This is not to say something. It is the reality. The same way that you believe in certain things of this kingdom. You also have to come to the point to believe in financial dominion. You have to come to the point to believe in financial dominion. It is subject to principles. If you don't step in there, you will not see the impact of it. But as you step in what the Lord asks you to do, you will see the change in your finances. People in scriptures has been moving from one level to another by just obeying these ordinances from the Lord. As stewards of God, we receive from God and we are to sow back to God so that the Lord will multiply what we sow and it reaches us for a higher height. Very important. And the enemy is doing so much harm against us. When we received, we don't want to sow. There will never be any multiplication until the seed is sown. If there is no multiplication, there is no increase. So from the very beginning, you have been at the same point and struggling from paycheck to paycheck and paycheck to paycheck and there is no increase. But if we do what the Lord required of us, you have to see this as kingdom principle. Principle. And it's a covenant. It's a principle that is linked to the covenant of God. The Lord God will never say anything that he will not do. 
If he said it, it's because it's already done and it is in enforcement. But it is in the form of a gift. Everything that comes from God to man is always a gift. And the Lord God will never force you to take it. But his hands is already stretched forth. That is the goodness of God. A man supposed to stretch forth your hand and take it from God. But if you sit down and you are not taking it and you keep play, praying, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. Meanwhile, what you are praying for, it is subject to a principle. Tap into that principle and see the releases over your life. Financial dominion, it is real. Because it is God's will for everyone and each one of us to walk in that dominion. So today, we are going to talk about different types of givings in the Bible. You have to know when you are given, what type of giving that you are subject to. What, when you release your finances what it is that you are releasing it for. So the title is Principal Types of Givings in the Bible. All satanic assaults against our finances, it is meant for us not to receive our breakthroughs and our blessings. The fact that the enemy attacks your finances it is to keep you in a position that you are always having just what you need for you and for your children. And you are not ready to release anything towards the kingdom that is going to multiply what you release for a higher height. That is what the enemy has been doing in our lives. So we are serving God always, you know, just at the edge of breakthrough. Because we are not breaking through. The covenant of the living God. You have to step in there. Break the barrier that separates you and that covenant because Jesus Christ had already torn apart and we have direct access to the spiritual face that we need to pull down. When we pray, we are praying to God and we asking God for certain things. The Lord released these things in the form of a seed. And we are meant to take this seed and so, as God is taking care of the things that are our needs, let me put it this way. But if a man comes to a point to see all his seed to be his need, you will never move forward. Never ever. There is no multiplication. What you get, that's all you have. And the next time you keep praying, the Lord will release it. What you get, that's all you have because there is no investment. You are not investing for increase you are not investing to get more added you keep and you are eating and you start over and you are getting and you keep and you are eating and you start over and it continues from generation to generations and our children's children we are not able to leave anything for them said so a good man leave that inheritance for his children his children so god has intention to bless us so that we become a blessing for ourselves, for our families but also living inheritance for our children's children. That is a fact. There is a statement that the Lord Jesus made and it is translated here by Apostle Paul in the book of Acts chapter 20 and the verse is 35 the word says, I have showed you all things. Apostle Paul telling the church, I have showed you all things. How that so laboring, ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And more we look into this, more you realize that it is very, very true. Very true. 
and we will get into different scriptures on other messages to confirm that indeed it is more blessing to give than to receive. In the world, the principle in the world is that when you keep, then you get more. When you keep, you get, and you are keeping, you are getting more. The paradox is that in the kingdom of God, more you give out, more you receive. It's amazing. More you give out, more you receiving, and more you are being increased. Kingdom principle. You want to understand how these things work? That is where God is God. That is where God remains and always be God. He does it such a way that you become a canal, not a channel, a canal. And your outlets are just reaching to so many people. And the Lord knows your heart that when he gives to you, you will not keep just for yourself. You will be able to release not only for his work, but also blessing other saints. So as a result of that, God said, mm -hmm, that is my son, that is my daughter, and the heavens are open over your life. And channel kingdom riches through you. And what out of what you are receiving, you will not even be using 1% because the volume is so great. The volume becomes so great that God opens the heavens. We say, oh Lord, open the heavens and pour us. If the heavens are open and you don't have canals to flow the releases of heaven, you will die. You cannot contain this. this you will die out of it. So once you, you are making the canals available, God will channel kingdom resources through you. Because he knows that more he's blessing you, more you become blessing to others. And people stand and pray and thanking God on your behalf. You see where the blessings are coming from. When you bless someone, the person stand out there and say, Oh God, thank you very much. My Lord and my Savior, please bless this man. That he continued to be a blessing unto me. And the Lord heard that prayer. And God continued blessing you. Now you have one person, two people, three people. And many that are just praying for you. And the Lord keep increasing you. It's a principle that you are not to wait until you get much before you start. As the Lord release a little seed unto you. You have to come to the point to sow it. And when you start, ah, you are starting with little. But as the little has been increased, the next time you are getting more than a little, and you keep sowing, and you keep getting, getting out of multiplication, the next thing you know, they cannot recognize you anymore. We are we remain, we are not doing what the Lord required of us. And we are remaining at the same level. And people of the world are not, they are not envying us in any way. Why? Because they are doing better than we are doing. As if our God hand is so short that he cannot release. But that's not God. His hand is God is a giver and there is nothing that almighty God cannot give. He has been in the business of giving from the very beginning until he gives, he gives, he gives, he gives to the point that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. What else God cannot give? This is our God. We are going to see four principal types of givings in the Bible. The number one is tight. Number one is tight. And the motivation of tight is obedience. What motives people to tight 
is what is obedience. The book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, the verse is 8 to 12. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Where, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes unto the storehouse, that they may be meat in my house, and prove me now well with, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before time in the field. Says the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed. For ye shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord God of hosts. That is what tithes does. Tithes open heaven, windows of heaven, and pour you out blessings. Not only that, tithes rebuke the devourer on your behalf, and protect your assets and your investment. Tight. How much? 10%. 10%. You get $10, it's $1. And these tight, they are divine connection. They are connected to the covenant. And they are connected to the blessings. The first time that the word tithe appeared in the Bible, Genesis chapter 14, and the verse is 18 to 20. Concerning Abraham that have gone to war and came back and with the spoil was met with a priest, Melchizedek. So, he said, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine and he was the priest of the most high God. And he blessed him. He blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the most high God, which had delivered thy enemies into thy hands. And he gave him tithes of all. The Lord sent to Abraham his priest. Remember, in the dispensation of grace, we are not under the priesthood after the order of Aaron, but we are under the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. And Abraham paid tithes of the spoil to Melchizedek. All that we are saying here is that we are highlighting the different types of givings in the Bible so you will know when you give what you are giving it for in which area of these types and what your return is all about. Tight, open windows of heaven. Number two type of giving in the Bible is called the first fruit. The first fruit. And the motivation behind the first fruit given is generosity. Generosity. The book of Exodus 23 and the verses 19. He said, the first of the first fruit of thy land Thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. The first 
of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Proverbs 3 and the verses 9 to 10. He said, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thy increase. So shall thy bowels be filled with plenty. So shall thy bowels be filled with plenty and thy press shall burst out with new wine. First fruit. Ezekiel 44 and the verse is 30. He said, And the first of all thy first fruit of all things, and every oblation of all, of every sort of your oblations, shall be the priest. Ye shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough, that he may cause the blessings to rest upon thy house. Bring it to the priest that he may cause the blessings to rest upon thy house. And the first fruit is showing that you are not a lover of money. You are giving it to the church or to the ministers. It shows your gratitude to God for the extra blessings. And it is done once a year. As we are all working and the Lord is blessing us. We heard a testimony that by God's grace, somebody has been moved from one position to a higher position. Which goes that the finance is not going to be the same. She is going to receive an increase. Something on top of her regular salary. The first day that you will receive it, what is on top is for the Lord. And it is done once a year. But if God is making your life an increase and they keep promoting you, keep promoting you, keep promoting you, promote your God and promote your life. He said the priest will cause blessings to rest upon thy house. Once a year. First fruit. Number three. Type of givings in the Bible. It is called alms giving. Alms giving. The motivation behind alms giving is compassion. Compassion. This giving is not given to God, but it is given to mankind. Alms given is not given to God, but it is given to mankind. There is a story in Acts 10, the verses 1 to 4. The word says, he said, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the bound called the Italian bound. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the night hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius, when he looked on him, he was afraid. And he said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Cornelius, thy prayers and thy alms given are come up for a memorial before God. And Acts 10, 31 says, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard and thy, alm, thy alms given are heard remembrance in the sight of God. So when we are given to people, they come before the Lord as remembrance in the sight of God. This is a given not to God. It's a given to people. 
This Cornelius, he was a Roman centurion. An unbeliever that was praying to God. A Gentile. The act of arms given gave him a position before the Lord. And he came before God as a remembrance. And an angel of the Lord was sent from heaven to come and talk to this man. His whole household was saved through this act. Obviously, you gave it to people. But listen to what Proverbs 19.17 says. He said, He that had pity upon the poor, he that had pity upon the poor, lended unto the Lord. And that which he had given, Will he pay him again? So when you have compassion upon people, upon the poor, and you will give to them, it comes before the Lord as remembrance. And the Lord says that you have lended what you gave to that poor to God. And God will pay you back. God will pay you back. So you can see the levels of the blessings. Tight, open heaven, windows of heaven to pour you out the blessings. First fruit, as you are given, the priest pray and cause blessings to rest upon your house. Alms given, as you are blessing the poor, you are lending this money to God and God will pay you back. Returns one to one. But this is the area that most people are given. Most people are given out of compassion. And the returns are one to one. As you give one dollar to that person, God will give you one dollar. And the last type of giving is called seed sowing. Seed sowing. In the book of Mark chapter 4 and the verse is 39. The motivation behind seed sowing is faith and reward. Faith and reward. Mark 4 3 says Hakim, behold, there went out a sower to sow. There went out a sower to sow. A story that we know very well. This sower sowed and different ground received the seed. But only one ground. The seed that fell on the good ground, verse 9, verse 8, and did yield fruit. That sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30 fold, some 60 fold, and some 100 fold. This is very important. So, as you are sowing, you have to identify a good ground to sow your seed. And we said that motivation behind it is faith. And reward. So if you have faith. To receive what the Lord has given you. And in faith. You sow. The reward is also being returned by faith. Some are receiving 30 fold. Some are receiving 60 fold. And some are receiving 100 fold. According to their givings. According to their givings. How much you put in, that is how much your reward is going to speak. That is why you see the differences in the levels of people in the church. Some are blessed 30 fold. Others are blessed 60 fold. And others are blessed 100 fold. Kingdom principle. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and the verses 6 to 8. 
I'm going to read this scripture and read it in two different versions of the Bible. King James first. The word says, he said, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. These are powerful scriptures filled with heavenly mysteries. It is for your understanding of these scriptures that will break forth your financial dominion. It is all about faith and reward. The same scripture that he said, God loves cheerful giver. You sow sparingly. You reap rikiki. You sow bountifully. You reap bountiful blessings. He loves cheerful giver. Give, 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 give. That's not God. God wants to see the giver that is given out of heart. Faith. It is out of love that we give to the work of God. When we love God, we give because God loves so much the world that he gave. Is only begotten son. So when we say, Lord, I love you, how great you are, how wonderful I let it also speak by your givings. I love the, the message version of the Corinthians, second Corinthians 9, 6 to 8 that we read. This is what he says. It says. Remember, a stingy planter, a stingy planter. So it's someone, he's so stingy that he doesn't even want to put his seed on the ground. That is devastating. You know what you are putting on the ground, it is going to bring forth and bring you increase. But you are even being stingy. You have a grain of corn in your hand. Put it on the ground so that it will bring forth hundreds of thousands. And you are being stingy, crying over a grain of corn. But you are ready to receive bountifully. Oh God, I thank you. I bless your name. Listen, but you are not ready. You are stingy on your seed. A stingy planter get a stingy crop a stingy planter he gets a stingy crop and he will move around he's saying that oh this year uh, the land was not really the rain was not it's not it has nothing to do with the land it has nothing to do with rain it has everything to do with the type of seed that you put on the ground god is not mocked he's not mocked The same way, a lavish planter gets a lavish crop. You release, you sow, you're going to see increase. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over. Apostle Paul said that he said to the church of the Corinth, please, what I'm saying, think over it. Take your time. And think through these things. And make your own mind what you will give. So what you receive, think about it. And then make your mind on how much you are going to give to the Lord and for the work of the living God. He said that this act 
it will protect you against soft stories and arm twisting you know what it means soft stories like oh my situation oh my, my sister and this thing that has happened to me and i my back was paining me and i have to go to the hospital and the letter that i saved they have taken it and they keep sending me bills and you continue storing and storing and storing and storing stories stories you will always have sub stories to tell because you are not doing what the Lord required of you he said it will protect you from arm twisting so Satan has released agents that are moving around twisting people's arms twisting their hands uh -huh, you got your paycheck don't worry give it to me and then he twist your hands and take it he said, I don't want you kids. Who are you to say you are not giving it? You are not stepping in God's covenant. I have every right to take it. And they twist your arm and they take it. You know what it means? Pastor, I'm not seeing any satanic agent coming to twist my arm. Now let me tell you. Suddenly. Suddenly from nowhere. Where you parked, there was a sign that says that today is a day that they are coming to clean the streets. Your eyes was closed on that sign. And automatically, Chicago City is coming and giving you tickets. Sudden ticket. You come in the morning, surprise. Your arm is already twisted. And many of these things that the devil is releasing against the children of God. Because we are being disobedient unto the things of God. So, he said, God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. God loves it. He loves the cheerful giver. But when the giver delights in the giving, God loves it. And if God loves it, what is it going to happen to you? Heavens are going to be open. And you become heavenly channel. And the Lord just keep releasing unto you. He said. God. Can pour on. The blessings. In astonishing ways. So that you are ready. For anything. And everything more. And just ready to do. What needs to be done. <laughs> These are powerful stuff. So. This is a Christian that is moving in a covenanted way and the whole heaven is backing him up. Every time that there is a need, heaven is already open. So before the need arises, heaven had already packaged because of your covenant deeds. That scripture is so powerful. The end, he said, God can pour on the blessings in aston an astonishing way astonishing way amazing way ways that you cannot even comprehend it so that you are ready for anything and everything for anything that comes on you on your way for everything that comes on your way more than just ready to do what needs to be done you are more than just ready to do what needs to be done. You are more than just ready to do what needs to be done. You are more than just ready to do what needs to be done. Hallelujah. This is the word of God. There is nothing else to be added. Except we being obedient and step in this covenant of God. God said, try me on this things and you will see if my name is not I am that I am. May the Lord God bless you. Amen. Everyone is very welcome and uh, we thank God for your lives. Uh, today being a very special day, to God alone be the glory. We are having a word uh, of circumstance that I titled Hearing from God Our Father Hearing from God Our Father 
before we get into details, we have to understand how the Trinity works. Because we talk about the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we pray, we pray to Almighty God the Father. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. So, when it is, it is stated that way, when it is stated that way, you come to find out that each one of them has its role. But not just what I am saying, but what the Bible says about the Trinity. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and the verse is 4 to 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 6. According to the word of God, this is in the case of heaven gifting his children. The case of heaven gifting his children. The word says that he said, now there are diversities of gifts. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. The same spirit with capital S. So, which means that all gifts, all gifts, all gifts from above will not be active or operated except through the Holy Spirit. If God gives you a gift, that gift will be activated and functioning only through the Spirit of God who is the Holy Spirit. That is what this scripture means. So you can see that in the area of God working with his children for his purpose in the surface of this world here, it cannot be done outside God's spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the custodian of the working of the gift in the children of God. The Holy Spirit, he is the one behind the activities, the performance, the working of the gift that God gave to his people. If truly the oppression of the gift is coming from Almighty God, then you're going to see the act of the Holy Spirit just in there. If the spirit behind the gift is not the Holy Spirit, then that gift is not from Almighty God. This is so important because such a time like this, in the end times, where many spirits are out there, where signs and wonders are being done in various places, and matter of fact, so many are caught not by the word of the Lord, but by the miracles and the signs and wonders. But the point is, is not, we are not led by miracles. We are led by the Spirit of God. So the fact that a spirit can lead you already is a very dangerous ground. That one must be extremely careful. Because how would you know that the oppression of that gift is of, the, of Almighty God or not? If it is of God, then it is being operated by the Holy Ghost. If not, then the spirit behind it is whatsoever spirit that is of the world. This must be clear because many are being led astray by such a time like this one. Many, many spirits are in the world out there and operating under in all, all kinds of anointing, so-called anointing and miracles and signs and wonders that are happening, but they are not from Almighty God. If the, 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 the signs and the wonders are from God, you will see the mighty work of the Holy Spirit. To God alone be the glory. Now there are diversities of gifts. There are diversities of gifts. But the same spirit. I'm not talking about the gifts today. I will talk about the gifts of God to his saints. To edify the church another time. But today. My whole purpose it will, is to let you understand the function of each person in the Trinity. We said that the Holy Spirit is the one that is behind the working of Almighty God in his children's life through the gifts that are from above. Verse 4 of 1 Corinthians, verse 5, verse 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that we are reading, he said, and there are differences of administrations but the same Lord. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. So the gift will not function except the Holy Spirit comes in to make it work. To make it work. But now, he's talking about administration. 
So the administration wise, it is all, he said, by the same Lord. Lord meaning Jesus Christ. Lord meaning Jesus Christ. And then let me read the, the last verse, which is verse 6. Then I will explain. He said, and there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Please, these scriptures are extremely important because for a child of God, most of the time we are confused about the Trinity. Who is doing what? And when I, I am praying, who do I pray to? I'm answering you right away. You pray to God in the name of Jesus by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. I said this before, but now how is the whole, you know, God's purpose being done here? The Trinity, God the Father and the Son are sitting in heaven. The Son sitting at the right hand of the Father. Both of them are sitting in heaven. The only one that is here on earth is the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, he is not just roaming around. He is just right there in you, dwelling in the believer. Dwelling in the believer. And at the same time, the Lord using his people to do what he has called them to do. Now, when heaven have decided to do something on earth here, how is the Trinity going to go about it? This, is, this, this, this scriptures here, these scriptures are explaining how God works. How heaven works here on earth. Now, he said that God the Father, he is the custodian of all operations. Because what he does is that once he has something in mind that he wants to do, all that he will do, he will go ahead and tell the son, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ being the administrator. So administ the purpose of administration is to make sure that things are organized and watch for it to happen. The one that is going to make it happen is the Holy Spirit. We said it. But before it happens, there must be administration. There must be structure. There must be organization. And this all is the function of Jesus Christ. So if God wants to do something here on earth, the Lord tells the Son, Almighty God the Father, tells the Son, Jesus Christ, this is what I have in mind and what I would like to do. Jesus Christ will look into the heavenly resources and start putting things in place. Angels are on assignment. The children of God that are called here, they are also going to be on assignment who has a gift that the Holy Spirit must come and empower him for the purpose of Almighty God. This is how the Trinity works over here. So you can see that he said it is God the Father. God the Father. Who worketh all in all. So the power behind it all is the one that sits on the mightiest of throne. He delegates the administration part of it to the son. And what the son does, he looks at his, his host. Remember, the commander-in-chief himself. The general overseer of the heavenly army. And he's going to move the angels. He's going to move the purpose, the saints of the living God, to bring forth the purpose of Almighty God. This is how Trinity works. So this is the reason why you cannot be confused. You cannot be confused. The father has gifts for his children. The son also has gifts for his children. And the Holy Spirit also has gifts for his children. Why? Because each one of them has a different role to play, but in one accord. In one accord. You can see that all the Trinity is targeting the common goal. The purpose is from the Father. The accomplishment, everybody must get involved. The Jesus Christ will come in, activate the whole heaven. You know, whosoever must be involved, to get them involved. And watch over the word to be performed by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit will go in action. He said he sent forth his word. Who is the word going to? The word is going to the Holy Spirit. Because even if God is asking a man to do something for, for his purpose, a man cannot hear directly from heaven. It takes the Spirit of God to hear the things of God. So it comes 
that the spirit of God must be communicating with the spirit of man. We talked about this last week, just last week. We talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, all the way down. So, it, it, it is all explaining that the spirit of man knoweth only the things of man. And the spirit of God also know only the things of, 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 God, of God. So, for the purpose of heaven to be established through man, on the, in the surface of this earth here, God must communicate to the Son, the Son communicates to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit communicates to man, and the Lord Almighty God, the Trinity, they are all watching for the performance of what has been said. To God alone be the glory. Hallelujah. There is something that is said about Jesus. Listen to this. That is the reason why I put kiss, kiss the Son and live. Kiss the son, Jesus Christ, and live. He said, Jesus, being the brightness of the glory of the Father. Jesus Christ, being the brightness of the glory of his Father. And the express image of his person. So, you see Jesus, you have seen the Father. You see Jesus Christ, you have seen the Father. You will see him as he is, not only in the image but also in character. Also in character. Because being the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Nothing works in God's purpose outside his word. And that word is Jesus Christ, by the way. And he said, when he had himself purged our sins, the father sat, sat him down on the right hand of the majesty on high. This is simply saying that the father, after glorification of the son, set the son on his right hand. When the father wants to do something in the surface of this universe, all that he must do is to communicate it to his son. And the son will move in, get it all administered, and the Holy Spirit will move in by the leadings of the, of, of the son, because he receives from the son and moves in, bringing all they that are involved over here to get that thing accomplished. Everything falls at the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is an explanation about this. The communication between the father and the son is what we have just seen. The communication between the son and the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, the book of John, John chapter 14 and the verse is 7 to 9. These are words that came out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, He said, If you have known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, ye know him and have seen him. So, it is coming as what was said before. The very brightness of his glory and the very image of his person. So, Philip came to Jesus and said unto Jesus, Jesus, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said unto, unto Philip, he said, how have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me? Philip, he that had seen me had seen the Father. And how sayest thou that? Show us the Father. So, you know, like we said, the image of the Father is the Son. The character of the Father is the Son. There is uh, John 1, 18. He talks about, he said, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, who is at the bosom of the father, he had come and declared him. This is a very bold statement because we know about Moses that asked God, God, let me see you, show me your face. God said, you can't see my face and live. A man cannot see my face and live. But man saw the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came. The, the John 1, 17 talks about, he said, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What the people of the Old Testament experienced through the law, 
what we are experiencing through the, the grace and the truth that came with Jesus is on a higher level. It's on a way higher level. You cannot compare any New Testament believer or New Covenant believer with an Old Covenant believer. What is in you? They didn't have it. That is why a child of God cannot be like a chicken mangling when you, you yourself, you know that you are an eagle that you're supposed to be flying. What you have today is way greater than any of this great, great prophets that lived before. You are greater than John the Baptist. But the Lord said that, you see, among they of the law, the greatest doesn't even come close to John, John the Baptist. But they that are in the kingdom of God, the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. So you can't compare yourself with Isaiah. You can't compare yourself with the Jeremiah. You can't compare yourself with Moses. You can't compare yourself with, with, with David. And people, even including a man after my own heart. You have the Holy Spirit with you. You stand on a better covenant. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen God. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen God. Why is it that you are asking me, show me the Father? You have seen me, Philip. You have seen my father. You see how I am acting, how I behave in my home, how I, I, I carry myself out there. You have seen the character of the father. For us, it's so great. Jesus Christ came here and never got married. It wasn't the plan of the father for Christ to marry. But he was constantly indeed a man, a family man. He had like eight people to take care of. He worked. He worked, and he worked very, very hard. We are not talking about the ministry work. We are talking about a man living. A man living. The man's ministry started only at the age of 30. He had three and a half years only in ministry. But he lived 33 and a half years. But the 30 years of his life was like any ordinary man. For what purpose? That man could be able to look unto Jesus Christ as the author and the finisher of our faith. Nobody in the Old Testament ever made this statement, follow me. Nobody. Jesus Christ was the only one and the first one that says, follow me. Follow me. We cannot follow any of the Old Testament because if you say that you want to follow according to the heavenly purpose for the children of God, when we are following someone, we must follow the person in image, in character, in everything. Jesus Christ came here and lived that life of example. He went through every struggle that you could go through. He went through, Pastor, but Jesus, he didn't get married. So how can he know what I'm going through with my husband? Let me tell you, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But our God is faithful. So the Lord knows everything about it. Whatever that you will be going through in your family, the Lord has been there. And he has gone through things that you, you will never have that opportunity to go through these things. If you have seen me, you have seen God. In other words, our characters, our behaviors must, as children of God, if people see you, they must see Jesus. If they see Jesus, they must see the Father. Somebody here, I pray for you, that someone sees you and see the image of God in your life in the name of Jesus Christ. I made a statement before. And I'm going to explain it because I said, I want to know the connectivity between Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the communication channel. Before that, hear this statement from God the Father to us. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 1, and the verses 1 and 2, the word says, he said, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spoke in time past unto the Father's by the prophets. What is this scripture saying? It is simply saying that I mentioned it that we are standing on a better covenant. He said in the time of old, in the old covenant, God was speaking to his people through chosen men. We call men of God. Prophets. 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 But watch this. But he said, had he, in verse 2 of Hebrew 1, had 
in these last days, God had in these last days spoken unto us by his son Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In these last days, God himself, he talks to us. He talks to his children through not the prophets. If the prophet is going to hear anything from above, it must, pro it must be proceeded from the son. Because the father talks to us through the son whom he had appointed as of all things by whom also he made the worlds so you can see that as far as jesus christ is concerned there is nothing nothing done in the surface of this universe from god almighty outside the sun please a clear understanding because sometimes people don't know how to worship god said should i worship god the father or should i sing unto jesus or uh, uh, sh should, I, should I praise the Holy Spirit? That is how I will make it. You know? And these things are becoming problems because some of them are emphasizing only the Holy Spirit. Some are saying that, no, 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 no. Holy Spirit is not important. Uh, Jesus is all. So let's, let's worship Jesus. Some say that, no, 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 no. If Jesus is there, if I have access to the Father, uh, let me just go and worship the Father. Let me tell you, according to the word of God, the Father receives nothing except through the Son. The father receives nothing except through the son. That is why I said, kiss the son and live. Kiss the son and live. If you want to bring, live your life and bring that greater glory to almighty God, please kiss the son and what? And live. Kiss the son and live. Hallelujah. Mm. These are so powerful because if you are in the sun, now you don't need to go to any prophet to hear from God. If you are in Christ, a child of God, you do not, you are not an old testament believer. He said, In the old testament, the Lord was speaking to his people through the prophets. But these last days, and we are in the last days, God talks to us through his son. So now if you want to hear from God, then you better develop the channel of hearing from Jesus. Hallelujah. We must know how to hear from Jesus Christ. And then that will be it. So, let me answer the statement that I made before about how is the communication between Jesus and the Holy Spirit since the Father and the Son are in heaven. Between the father and the son is not a problem because we have just, we have seen it. He said he talks to the son right, right at, his, at, at, at his right hand. But the son, to the Holy Spirit, how is it being done? The book of John, John chapter 16 and the verse is 12 to 15. Coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ himself, Jesus said, I have yet many things to say unto you. He was talking to the disciples. So basically, he, you are the disciples of Christ today. The Lord was just addressing to you. I have many things to say unto you. But ye cannot bear them now. Ye cannot bear them now. You know, at that time, it was very true. Because at the time that Jesus was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit has not been given. The Holy Spirit has not been given. And this is, this is, this is John, you know, this, this, this is John 16. John 17 is the prayer, the priesthood prayer. So Jesus Christ is about to be taken to heaven. And these are the last words from Jesus to his children, to his disciples. And today that will come to him through the disciples, you and I. He said he has many things to tell them. So he, which means that he has been telling them many things because he was physically present and he, keep, you know, he kept teaching them, teaching them. But now he's going to be taken away. So I still have many things to tell you, but some of these things, when I say them, you will not understand them. He was talking about a level that a man or a believer or a child of God needs to get to start, you know, receiving 
some secret things from, from heaven. I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. You cannot bear them now. You cannot understand them now. You cannot take them now. Like people, when they are overwhelmed, they said, I can't take it anymore. Uh -huh. But the Lord said that you cannot bear them now, but listen to what he said afterwards. He said, how be it? When he, hallelujah, when he, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth with a spirit with capital S, that is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the third person of the Trinity. I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Holy Spirit is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. He shall glorify Jesus. Holy Spirit shall glorify Jesus. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father had are mine. Hallelujah. You have seen me, you have seen the Father. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore said I, that the Holy Spirit shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. If you receive from Jesus, you have received from God. Hallelujah. If you, have, you are receiving from Jesus Christ, you are receiving directly from the throne of Almighty God. It's amazing. The Holy Spirit, who is our helper here, the one that is in us and helping us to talk to heaven, for heaven also to talk to us. This is the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he will not author a word. He will not say a word. He will not act until he had received the instruction from our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he knows that whatsoever the Son will tell him, it is the word of the Father. It is the word of the Father. He said, every single thing that the Holy Spirit will do in you, it will bring glory to Jesus. And we know that Jesus Christ himself is not taking glory. He's returning the glory to the Father. Hallelujah. What a mighty structure. What a mighty delegation. It's so wonderful when people can come together in one accord. What they can achieve is just amazing. Everyone has his, his role. Do you think that, I mean you just watch it. Do you think when the the father sits down and wants to do something on earth. It is in the power. Everything that must be done here on earth must be done in power. Because of the forces that are at work. Here is the domain of the devil. Here in this world is the domain of the, de of the devil. Why am I saying that Jesus Christ himself saw Satan coming and he said the prince of this world. If he's the prince of the world, it means that this is for him. He said, the prince of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. But in his priesthood prayer, in the John 17, you come to find out that he told the father, he was praying to his father. He said, father, the work that you gave me to do here, I am done with it and I am coming back. But the people that you gave me, when I was here, I kept them. But now that I'm coming, oh Lord, they are in the world, but they are not from the world. They are in the world, but they are not talking about you and I. They are in the world, but they are not from the world. Therefore, keep them away from the evil one. So this place is, is an evil place. The world is an evil place. And we know this because everyone who has not, you know, any understanding of this place being evil has been fallen victim. Second Corinthians 4, 4, he said the prince of this world, he's moving around blindfolding people. So even their eyes are completely blind. They are moving around not knowing what is going on. And destinies are being scattered, shattered, and people are missing God's purpose. But the Holy Spirit is given. The Holy Spirit is given for, and it is given inside people, in a week. In a week. So when God is about to do something in a man's life, when God is about to do something for his own glory through a man, let me tell you, there is no power of darkness that can stand against the move of Almighty God. Because it is decided from the throne of heaven. 
it is decided in power and the one who made the statement for it to move forth and get it done released the statement to the sun the sun put in place all the necessary things the angels and the, and the favor and the anointing and everything else that must be in place for that child of god to move ahead and get it done i have not seen it yeah have not heard it neither have it entered into the heart of any man the things that god had prepared for them that love him but god had revealed those things unto us by his holy spirit for the spirit searcheth all things yea the deep things of god the things that god wants you to do they are hidden in almighty god no man has access no man no man no spirit has access to because the Holy Spirit, who is even the Trinity, the third person of the Trinity, he must search deep in God to find out what the Lord has in store for your life. And he's the one who is going to do it. Faithful is he who calleth thee. He also will do it. Hallelujah. When, you know, that is why you should not be living your life in contention. You should not be living your life in envious. You should be happy when you see people doing well. You should be able to come with brethren and for heaven purpose to be established. Why? Because today, maybe it's your brother's turn. Tomorrow, it's going to be your turn. We are not to be jealous about one another because heaven had plans for everyone and each one of us. And heaven that gave you that plan, no power can stand against that plan. The only one that can destroy it is you. Because God is not going to do anything against a man's will. So as you stand against the purpose of God, it will never come to pass in your life. But if you come, you know, in line with the leadings of the Holy Spirit, everything that God has called you to do will surely come to pass unto his glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, my Lord. That is the reason why in Romans 8 and the verses 14, he said, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. You see, the reason why, if God, you are a child of God, you are led by the Spirit of God. In Romans 8, 16, he said, because how, yes, I asked this question before, and the answer is just right here. As many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Okay, so this is how we recognize a child of God. A child of God is the one that is led by the, the, the Spirit of God. But you, how do you know that you are a child of God? How do you know? It is very easy for you to know who is a child of God. Who is a child of God is the one that is led by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Ghost. But how do you know that you are a child of God? Let me tell you how you know that you are a child of God. Romans eight sixteen, he said, the Holy Spirit... The Holy Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Hallelujah. You cannot know that you are a child of God unless you receive inner witness. You cannot know that you are a child of God unless it is being witnessed by the Holy Spirit to your spirit. So this is not feelings. We are not talking about feelings. We are talking about inner witness. When you are a witch, you know you are a witch. So it is, if you are a child of God, you know you are a child of God. How do you know you are a child of God? The Holy Spirit that dwells in you. Witness with your own spirit that you are a child of God. Uh, so the point is very clear. If truly you are not deceiving yourself, if truly you are not moving around portraying who you are not, and you will come to be sincere to yourself. Every area that the Lord requires you to work out, you will be sincere and you will be working it out. Why? Because you want to make it back home. You want to make it back home. You don't want to be destroyed on earth here. They that are sent by God, they preach the word of God. And they that are sent by God, they do God's will. So if you come to find out that indeed, you are a child of God by the inner witness between the two spirits. The Holy Spirit, who is looking into heaven, heaven's records and saying that, oh, okay, this one here is a child of God. 
and will be testifying to your own spirit that indeed you are enlisted as a child of God. Then you know. And once you know that this is who you are, you move around accordingly. When you are a prince, you don't move like a servant unless you have lost your state. This is what the heaven, you know, it's amazing how heaven sees us. We don't even know. You know, we come moving around, rikiki, children of God. That, like, but heaven, the purpose of God for our lives, what heaven has done for us, they are so mighty. So mighty. I received something from heaven. And I told, I met the person yesterday. And I told the person, I said, you know what? This is uh, what I received about you. She said, ah, Pastor Chas, <laughs> I'm very afraid. Oh, but I, I know you are not afraid at all. Why are you not afraid? I know you are not afraid. I said, Madam, why must I be afraid? Why must I be afraid? Because your God that loves you so much, whatever that the enemy has planned behind the scene to bring it as a surprise package unto you, has come to the broad daylight, has come to the light of the living God, and you are being, you, you are being you know, told about what the plan of the enemy against your life is all about. Rejoice! Rejoice our God he reveals to redeem. Deuteronomy 29, 29. He said the secret things, they belong to God. But the things that are revealed, they are for us and for our children. Now that you know what the enemy is about to do, stand with the authority in our Lord Jesus Christ. Use the heavenly tools, the salvation tools. Stand against it. Whatever that you decree here, it shall be decreed in heaven. You bind here, it shall be bound in heaven. The whole heaven. It's already at work. The proof is that you came to receive it. You receive it. How did you receive it? From the above. From the above. So before heaven does anything, we saw it. That the father himself must orchestrate it. Operate it. In order, he's, he's the custodian of operation. And afterwards, release the administration wise to the son. And for the performance of the Holy Spirit. So if you are receiving from above, the Holy Spirit reveal it to you. And if the Holy Spirit reveal it to you, it means heaven, the Father, is already aware of it. So rejoice. Rejoice. All the applause will come to naught in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not moving around as orphans. We are children. We are not bastards. We have a Father, a heavenly Father, who puts you here on earth for his purpose. Even when we come to lose our earthly parents, we still rejoice because we know that there is a higher, a higher father, a higher power that is watching over our lives, that we are here on assignment. And the good thing about it is that someone said, he said, I don't like Mother's Day, I don't like Father's Day because I have lost my parents. And nobody is going to keep his parents forever. Nobody. Because your parents, they have been also somebody's children. And that is how life is. No one will escape death. You, won't, you can't. So what is important is that now that they gave birth to you, uh, you know, they gave you the training and all that your system values are built by them. We thank God. Now you know God. Start living the purpose of God for your life. Start taking glory that many that also had parents did not even have the opportunity to live and be having the number of years that you are having. The enemy one way or another killed them. Killed them. But you are alive. Celebrate their lives. Celebrate the fruits of their labor. Because you are the fruit of their labor. So rejoice. Rejoice. So in Father's Day celebration, Mother's Day celebration, you have to see God. You have to see God. You have to see God. You have to see the purpose of Almighty God in your life. We are not hooked to people. We are children on assignment for God's purpose. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm bringing everything to an end, but not without this. The book of Jeremiah 29, and let me read the verse 11 to 13. God said something through his prophet Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, let me tell you my mind concerning mankind. He said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Thought of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. To give you an expected end. God who put you here has a wonderful plan for you. 
He knows why he put you here. He has a plan for your life. That is why when one is living his life, moving around carelessly, and I don't know what God has called me to do and all that, you know, you come to God and allow the Holy Spirit to move in your life. I, I guarantee you, you will know what God has called you to do. Probably you are even doing it. You will be doing it when you don't even know that you are already in God's plan. Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thought of peace. We give God glory. The Lord always has wonderful plans. God is not a God of evil. Your God is not here. He's a father. He's not here to punish you. The Lord is here as a father. If you are going on the wrong route, his responsibility is to put you right. Is to put you right. The thought that I think of you, they are thought of peace and not evil to give you an expected end. So to God alone be glory. Where you are going, the Lord has been there. Hallelujah. Where you are going, where the Lord is taking you, he has been there. You know, it's so wonderful how heaven works with his people. If God is taking you from point A to point C, God will walk through A and C and come back to A and hold your hands and say, my son, my daughter, let's go. Our destination is C. When we get to B, it is not the final. The Lord keeps you going. So that is why no matter what goes on in life, continue holding on this God. Because as far as there is a scent of water in this body, as far as there is a scent of water in life, there is what? There is hope. So you, if you are not be, you know, uh, careful about what people are saying and what people are doing and what, all the circumstances that are happening around you. The Lord holds your hands. And he said, you shall see that thousand falling here, ten thousand falling there, but it will not come to your dwelling. But even many, 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 when so much is happening, people say that there, are, there is a casting down. But you, you, because God holds your hands, you shall say there is what? A lifting up to God alone be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. To give you an expected end. So then how can you obtain God's plan? How can you obtain God's plan? The Lord said, verse 12 of Jeremiah 29, to obtain that plan, then ye shall call upon me. God's plan is not done outside God. God's mandate for your life is not done outside God. I have said this before, that there is no unbeliever that can fulfill the heavenly plan for his life. Listen to me, God can use you. But for the plan of God to be fulfilled in your life, it takes the Holy Spirit. So when you are not a believer, Holy Spirit is not given, given to unbelievers. You have to come. Holy Spirit is only given at salvation. So when you have come and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, automatically you don't even need to pray. Holy Spirit comes in there and starts heavenly plans for your life. Unbelievers cannot fulfill God's plan for their life. But you, you, ye shall call upon God and ye shall go and pray unto him. How do you call upon God? Go and pray to God. How do you fulfill heavenly mandate over your life? Stand in prayer. Continue praying. Continue praying because as you pray, you are activating, you are calling upon the heavens. Ye shall go and pray unto me. And I will hearken unto you. In other words, I will listen to you. And ye shall seek me. Ye shall seek me. Ye shall seek me and find me. You will look for God, you will find him. Ye shall seek me and find me. And he, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Be single-minded. Focus. Focus on the heavenly mandate. Know that the one who can establish it is your almighty God. Set your eyes on God. Call upon his name. No matter how difficult the circumstances are, continue focusing on God and allow God to hear from you and he will be doing the wonderful things that he has called you to do. My last thing, thoughts, let me give it. It's going to be through scriptures. Now, most of the time, the Holy Spirit talks to us and we are not hearing him. We have already established the communication between the Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So now, as far, the only last communication is between the Holy Spirit and man. Between the Holy Spirit and man. By default, God gave us a gift. It is called the gift of discernment. It is called the gift of discernment. This is something that the people of the old did not have. Because 
it's, it is, it's, a, it's an inner life thing. It's an inner life thing. It is a work that is done internally by the Holy Spirit. And a man, a child of God, must be sensitive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't shout. It's the small, still voice. So it needs quietness. I'm not talking about uh, environment noise. I'm talking about the inner quietness. A channel that is open to hear from the Spirit. A channel that is open in the child of God's life to hear from the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't shout. The Holy Spirit is the prompting Spirit. He will prompt you. Do you know how the law of God was given to Moses? In the form of tablets. Tablets of stones. We, children of God, in the dispensation of grace, people say, as we read in one, John 1.17, one the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. It seems like the law is over. Yes, the law of Moses is over, but not the law in Christ Jesus. Not the law in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.2, he said, for the law of the spirit of, of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Law of sin and death. That is the law of Moses. But the law of the spirit of life, the law of the spirit of life, life has a law that is in Christ. Every child of God is ruled and governed and led by the law in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit. So even if it was not read to you that this is sin, don't do this. Let me tell you, by the time that you are getting yourself in there, you are going to hear the prompt of the Holy Spirit. This is how people come, up, come around and say that, oh, I was going to do this and I felt like, oh, something told me. It is, there is nothing like something that told you. It's an inner, inner word from the Holy Spirit. You never come to find out the exact word about that particular situation. Probably never read it. But let me tell you, the day that you get yourself into that situation, the Holy Spirit will read that word to you. He will prompt you. You will know that say, mm, this is not... I shouldn't get myself into this. Hear the, 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 the voice of the Spirit and stop it when the Holy Spirit is stopping it. But you know how man is. Man starts seeing his interest in all kinds of situations and overruling the voice of the Holy Spirit. God knows this. So the Lord did one thing. He said, since I will be talking to you when you are alert and you will blush everything that I will say, I still have a choice to talk to you. I still have ways to talk to you. Let's see these ways. So in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2 and the verses 7, a statement is made in a form of promise from the book of Joel. He said that, he said this, he said, it shall come to pass in the last days, and we are in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit, I will pour out Holy Spirit, I will pour out Holy Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters, shall prophesy and your young men they shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams hallelujah your old men shall dream dreams so in the last days the ministry of dreams and the visions they shall be increased the ministry of dreams and the visions shall be increased in the last days because god said that this is what i'm going to do i'm going to give you the holy spirit this is so wonderful because that is exactly what jesus christ said in john 16 that we just read jesus said Holy Spirit will take from me and show it unto you. Matter of fact, he will even show you things to come. He will even show you things to come. When people are moving around, visiting fetish priests, a Baba, and this one, and that one, roaming around, getting powers and all that. Let me tell you, heaven watches over your life. Heaven watches over your life. Power, there is no power but of God. Let them go to the sea, let them go to the highlands, let them go to wherever that they want to go. But they will come to you in evil way and the Lord shall scatter them all in the name of Jesus Christ. It's a fact. It's a fact. When you are, you, 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 you will just be lying there, watch this, in the book of Job, Job 33, and the verse is 14 to 18. We are talking about dreams now. The Lord said, he said, for God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth not. Hallelujah. God, the Father, he talks only once. God, the Father, when he has something to say, he will say it once. 
Why is that? It makes, you know, the understanding is so clear because he's talking to the son. When he has something for us, he tells the son. So he speaks once. But twice have I heard it. How is that? Because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit takes from the son and repeats it unto you. Repeat it unto you. Probably you were so busy. Then he said, I still have another channel to communicate to you. Ah, God speak at once, yea, twice, yet man perceive it not. So, in a dream, in a dream, in a dream, please watch this. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then God opened the ears of men and sealed their instruction that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. Hallelujah. I'm going to explain this because if you are here and you are dreaming and you are taking your dreams for Maybe the movie that I watched yesterday. Please, don't assign these dreams to the movie. Because the enemy is stealing from you. And if you are here, a child of God, and you are not receiving dreams, still, you have to do something about it. The enemy is also stealing from you. Dreams are heavenly visions. He calls it dreams. He calls it the vision of the night. When deep sleep falleth upon man. When the body is not in action anymore. Yes, you are not dead. You are on that bed. Your heart is functioning. But he said, the Lord openeth man. Openeth man for what? Open the door, the spiritual door of man's life. And he sealeth man instructions. Instructions. Instructions for what? So that man would not... He said, then he will redraw man from his purpose. Redraw man from his purpose. What purpose? Man comes here. God gave him a purpose. Man gets here and man starts doing his own thing. But that is not God's will. The Lord knows that that thing that you want to do so much on this earth here, this is exactly what the enemy is going to use to destroy your life. It will not bring any glory to God. But that is what you are living for. You are so much, you know, so much working for it and all that. But God knows that that is exactly what is going to destroy you. The next thing you know, heaven is open to you at night. And the same thing that you are working so hard for, you come to see completely crushed or something happened to it. And you stand there, you wake up in the morning and you say, hey, in the name of Jesus, devil, I bind you. Don't bind devil, it was God. Do not bind devil, it was absolutely from Almighty God. God is telling you that what you are doing, where you are spending all your time, all your resources, energy and everything else, it will amount to nothing. That is not his will. It's not his will. So, he redraw man from his own purpose. Redrawing you from your own purpose and take pride out of man. The man is doing that for his own so that when you move around, hey, doctor, <laughs> hey, honorable, and your shoulders are like this. Meanwhile, you are more than uh, <laughs> nothing before God. More than nothing. Uh, so, what profited the man to gain the whole world? When he loses his soul. That is exactly what this scripture is saying. He said, I open man's mind in the realm of the spirit. So that I can keep man back from his soul being destroyed. Did you read that? He said in verse 18 of Job 33. He said he kept back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. His life from perishing by the soul. So I have come to tell you. We are talking about how to hear from heaven. You have seen that we have talked about so many things. How heaven keeps talking to us. How heaven keeps talking to us. This is it. If you are here doing your own project, please. Start praying. Call upon heaven. For the Lord to put you on the right channel. If you are here taking dreams for granted. Please. Start praying. That may the Lord God guide you to his perfect will. If you are here, you are not dreaming. Or you dream and you have. You wake up in the morning, you have forgotten everything. Start praying. 
ask the Lord to show you the way. To open that way to you. So that you will receive from above. This is how we hear from God. In various, various, various ways that we have talked about. May the Lord bless his word in your life. May the Lord's purpose be accomplished in your life. Whatsoever that God has called you to do, you will not come here and waste God's resources, but you will come and do what God has called you to do. To him alone be the glory for your life that you are living here. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And bless you and bless you. Everyone is very welcome and we thank God for your lives. Today we have a word from the living God that we titled, Life after the flesh kills. Life after the flesh kills. It is very simple. You know, in the book of Genesis, we're not going to read the details. The book of Genesis chapter 4 and the verses 1 to 8. There is a story of a family that opens the Bible about Adam and Eve's family, having two children, Cain and Abel. We come to find out that Cain killed his brother, his junior brother, Abel. And we asked ourselves so many questions about what happened. Bible relates so many things about the details the Lord telling Cain, Cain, sin is lying at the door, be careful. He's looking for you. When he gets you, you are not going to be well. It comes to a point that Cain despised what the Lord God is saying. And at the end of it all, he finished by killing his brother and all kinds of problems that follow. But the point is this. We are from the same family. What is it that had gone wrong for a brother, for a sister to kill a brother, or for a brother to kill a sister, for a brother to kill a brother, for a sister to kill a sister. Something definitely is not right. In the case of uh, Cain and Abel, we come to find out that hatred, jealousy, anger, selfishness, obviousness, all these things, they come together for a brother to kill a brother and a sister to kill a sister. These are the devices of the enemy. And when one is not having a clear understanding, you come to be a victim of the craftiness of the devil. Victim of the craftiness of the devil. Jesus Christ made a statement in Matthew chapter 7 and the verse is 18 to 20. He said, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is weighed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruit, we shall know them. Wherefore, by their fruit, we shall know them. So, you man, God is not mocked, and you cannot deceive Almighty God. And so, it is also for our lives, as Jesus is, so we are. We are not to be deceiving ourselves either. If you are of the nature of good tree, you will bring forth good fruit. If you are of the nature of evil tree, you are bringing forth evil fruit. Uh, a good tree by nature cannot bring forth evil fruit. This is what the word is telling us. So there is nothing like, or oh, it looks like, nothing like that. It is either black or it is either white. Clear. The line of demarcation is the word of God. It divides it. He divides it. He pierced to the asunder and divided anything that cannot be divided. But the word comes in and everything is clear. So we cannot be moving around as children of God and deceiving ourselves. He said, by their fruit, we shall know them. We shall know them. So what is the difference between a child of God 
and the child of a devil. Because that is a fact. We have children that are of the devil and we have children that are also of almighty God. How would you know who is of the devil and who is of our Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, Romans 8, 9, he said, If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If any man had not the spirit of Jesus Christ, that person do not belong to Jesus. So if the person is not of Christ, then the person is of the devil. Are only two kingdoms. Only two kingdoms. If you are not of Jesus Christ, you are of the devil. No matter what you say and whatever that you believe. Confirmation here is in 1 John chapter 3 and the verses 10. He said, In this the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil, you see that? The Bible tells us two categories, two groups of people. The children of God on one side and the children of the devil on the other side. So he says, how do you distinguish them? He said, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. So in other words, there are certain things that people do that allows you to know that this is a child of God and this is not a child of God. It's as simple as that. So as a child of God, your nature, it is what is in you, what is operating in you. Because he says that if you are a child of God in Romans 8 now, 8, 9,